Well, hello again. So quantum confinement, the subject of the last lecture, is one important way that quantum mechanics manifests itself in semiconductors. Quantum tunneling and quantum reflection are two other important ways that can occur from time to time. That's the subject of this lecture. So let me first of all uh, look at a barrier here. So consider an electron that encounters a barrier, an energy barrier. This is an electron with energy E. It encounters a barrier that has a higher energy. And let's ask ourselves what happens classically. Well, classically, there's no chance that this electron can get on the other side of the barrier because it doesn't have enough energy. It can't hop over. So the probability that it will transmit across is zero. Now, if I were to look at an, at an electron with a higher energy, an energy above the top of this barrier, then there's no problem. The electron can go right across. The probability is one that it will transmit across and come out the other side. This is how electrons would behave if they were classical particles and they encountered a barrier. But electrons are quantum mechanical particles, so they're actually waves at the same time. If an electron at energy E that is less than the energy of the barrier encounters the barrier, there is now actually some probability that the electron can tunnel or leak through. It may be a small probability or might be a considerably uh, significant probability depending on the width of the barrier and the height of the barrier. On the other hand, an electron that has an energy E prime which is above the top of the barrier, now might not completely transmit across. It might have less than a, the probability of one of getting to the other side. Some of it might reflect and go out. So these two phenomena are something that we want to understand. To understand these phenomena, we should begin with the wave equation. So here's our time-independent wave equation again. Uh, when the energy is greater than the potential energy, we write it, uh, this form is k squared, so we can write the wave equation this way. The solutions in this case, when the energy is above the potential energy, are waves in the plus x or minus x direction. On the other hand, if we have an energy that is below the top of the barrier, then this quantity is negative. We rewrite the wave equation in this form in terms of a parameter alpha, where we've defined things so that the parameter alpha squared is positive. And the solutions to this wave equation are either exponentially growing or exponentially decaying uh, functions of position. All right, so let's look back at our problem again and see if we can understand what's happening. Let's pick an energy that is above the potential energy uh, before the barrier and after the barrier, but which is below the potential energy inside the barrier. Well, we know the form of the solutions before the electron encounters the barrier. It's a wave in the plus x direction plus a wave in the minus x direction. We know the form of the wave function after the barrier. It's also a wave in the plus x direction and in general in the minus x direction. And we know the form of the solution for the electrons inside the barrier. They're exponentially growing and exponentially decaying uh, solutions. Okay, so let's define a problem here. We're going to define a problem where the incident wave has an amplitude of one. That'll be the A in the previous slide. And we're going to ask, what is the probability that it transmits across? On this side, we're going to have what we call an absorbing contact. Anything that comes across is just absorbed, nothing comes in. So there's no way of propagating in the minus x direction on this side of the barrier. Uh, the electron that doesn't transmit across will be reflected. So there will be some portion of the incident wave that is reflected and travels in the minus x direction. Instead of calling that B like I did on the previous slide, I'll call that R for reflection. And inside the barrier, we have a exponentially growing and decaying solutions with constant C and D that we have to determine. Okay, The part that transmits across, I'm going to label that with an amplitude T that represents the transmission amplitude. Okay, So to solve a second order differential equation, we need to apply two boundary conditions. And we need to figure out now what those boundary conditions are at these two interfaces where the solution changes.
Okay. So if I look there, I'm going to argue that the wave function and its derivative have to be continuous at interfaces. Uh, this will give me two boundary conditions at the first interface, two boundary conditions at the second interface. Now, you can see why that's a plausible, physically reasonable boundary conditions or set of boundary conditions by looking at the wave equation and rewriting it as d dx of d psi dx. So what this says is that the wave function must be continuous, otherwise I'm going to get an infinity here. On the other hand, the slope of the wave function, the derivative of the wave function, must also be continuous, otherwise I'll get an infinity here. And we know that the solution should be continuous because psi star psi represents the probability of finding an electron, and that should vary smoothly throughout the structure. So those are our boundary conditions for the, for the uh, wave equation. So at the first boundary, we will establish the condition that at x equals zero, the wave function uh, is continuous. So at zero minus, it's equal to the wave function at zero plus. And also the condition that the slope psi prime at zero minus is equal to the slope at, psi, at x equals zero plus psi prime. So if we do that and just specify it with the form of the equations, that we, that we have postulated from before, we can set the continuity of the wave function and its derivative, and we arrive at these two equations. Okay, we can do the same thing at the second boundary. The wave function has to be continuous across this interface at d minus and at x equals d plus, and the derivative of the wave function also has to be continuous there. Again, we know the form of the solutions. We can simply apply these boundary conditions to the form of the solutions that we know, and we arrive at these two equations. Now it's simply a matter of doing some algebra and solving for these equations. Okay. So if we go through that algebra, and, and I'm not going to do that here. You're welcome to, to do it. It's a good exercise. But we're only going to look at some of the features of the solution, understanding the process that we go through to get the solution. So we have our incident wave with amplitude 1, we have a reflected wave with amplitude r, we have a transmitted wave with amplitude t, and by solving that system of four equations that we just described, we can calculate the various probabilities. In general, the amplitude t is a complex number. We're looking for the probability that the flux of electrons is transmitted. That's going to be a real number between 0 and 1, so we're interested in the transmission, script t, which is the magnitude of little t squared. Well, go through the algebra. This is the result that we get. It's a rather complicated looking expression, but let's take a look at it. Okay, so here's the expression that we arrive at for the probability that an electron with an energy less than the height of the barrier will transmit through the barrier and come out the other side. If the barrier is just a little bit thick, it doesn't take very much, then the cinch of alpha d, which is related to two exponentials, e to the alpha d minus e to the minus alpha d. If alpha, the product of alpha times d is large enough, then we can ignore the second exponential, and this is approximately e to the alpha d divided by 2. That means since squared is approximately e to the 2 alpha d divided by 4, and that's quite large, can be very large, assuming that the barrier is thick enough here. Well, we make that approximation, we ignore the 1 here, we simplify the sin squared and write it as e to the alpha d, uh, 2 alpha d, we get a simplified expression for the transmission. Remember that we know alpha and k. Alpha is related to the potential inside the barrier, u0. The potential outside the barrier is 0, so k is, is the wave vector of those traveling waves. And we know what that is, given that we know the energy of the incident electron. Okay, So we can write the transmission in this formula. It's a little bit complicated again, but the procedure itself is what I want to make sure that you understand how we go about setting up the problem and getting a result that looks like this. So we're going to examine this result and see if we can uh, identify a few takeaway points that we want to remember. The first thing this expression tells us is that the transmission probability decreases exponentially with the thickness of the barrier. So that's something very important to remember about quantum mechanical tunneling. 
This expression also shows us that the transmission probability decreases exponentially with the height of the barrier. That's also very important to remember. And it's also worth remembering that the transmission probability decreases exponentially as the mass of the particle increases. So that's important to remember because if we have a light effective mass, we're going to expect more tunneling than for semiconductors with a heavy effective mass. Well, it's important to know about tunneling because tunneling can play a role in semiconductor devices. Oftentimes it's, a, it's not a beneficial role, but sometimes it is. So for example, here's a cross-sectional uh, diagram of a MOSFET. We're not going to be talking about the physical operation of the MOSFET here, but I just want to look at the heart of the MOSFET and point out where quantum mechanical tunneling can become a problem. So here I have a gate, a metallic gate electrode that I'm going to apply voltages to. Here I have a silicon material, and this is the silicon channel underneath the gate. And there's a very thin insulating layer that separates the metallic gate electrode from the underlying silicon. We want to apply voltages to the gate and influence the potential in the silicon, but we don't want current to flow from the gate into the semiconductor. That's the function of this insulating layer, this thin silicon dioxide layer between the gate and the silicon. Now, in modern day transistors, uh, before very recent times when people have switched to other materials, that gate oxide continued to be shrunk down from one technology generation to the next, to the next, to the next, after 40 plus years. Each generation, that gate insulator would be thinned down until it was thinned down to a thickness of about 1.1 to 1.2 nanometers. Of course, technologists would have preferred to have continued to shrink the dimension down, but it's getting very thin now. It's only four atoms or so thick. But the problem that is occurring in these very thin insulators is that quantum mechanical tunneling began to occur and current began to flow from the gate electrode into the silicon, which is very detrimental to the performance of the MOSFET. As we've learned, the tunneling current depends exponentially on the thickness of the insulator. This silicon dioxide thickness is 1.1 to maybe 1.2 nanometer thick. It's not one nanometer thick because that would increase the gate leakage current exponentially and would lead to unacceptable uh, performance of nanoscale MOSFETs. So quantum mechanical tunneling can be something that is, is very important to recognize and know about in semiconductor devices. Now, I'll just mention very briefly that it can sometimes be used to advantages and some very curious things can happen when you think about electrons as waves. So, for example, here's my barrier with some modest thickness. There is some probability that electrons can tunnel across and that probability might be much less than one. What happens if I put two barriers together? You might expect that the probability of transmitting across two barriers in series would be even smaller than the probability of transmitting across one. But there's a phenomenon known as resonant tunneling. The reflection and transmission of electron waves back and forth in this cavity can lead up in, in a way that at certain particular energies and certain particular wavelengths, all of those interference processes occur constructively. And you can actually, at some specific energies, get a transmission of one across these two barriers whereas the transmission across any one individually by itself without these reflection processes would be very, very small. So people actually make semiconductor devices based on this kind of phenomenon. Well, tunneling can be very important. Usually it's important in a negative way, but sometimes we can take advantage of it. Quantum mechanical reflections can also occur, and it's worth knowing about them. You know, if I had a classical particle with an energy that was high enough to get over the barrier, it would just go over the barrier. But for a quantum mechanical particle, there is a probability that the electron might reflect off the barrier so that it doesn't completely transmit through. This would be a quantum mechanical reflection. Uh, if we want to avoid such reflections, then we would want to we would want to slowly vary the potential so that those reflections don't occur. How slowly would we have to vary those so that the electron doesn't see an abrupt change in potential and reflect? We would have to vary the potential slowly on the scale of the electrons, the Broglie wavelength. 
we saw that that was roughly 10 nanometers or so in silicon. So we'd have to vary our potential slowly on the scale of 10 nanometers if we don't want quantum mechanical reflections to occur. All right, so let's summarize. Quantum mechanical tunneling and reflection are both processes that can occur in semiconductor devices. Um, tunneling can degrade the performance of a device, it can occasionally be used to benefit. Reflections can also degrade the performance of devices. A classical particle uh, can get over a barrier if it has enough energy. If it doesn't have enough energy, it can't get over. Quantum mechanical particles, however, can tunnel through the barrier even if they don't have sufficient energy to get through. It's important to remember three things about the tunneling processes. The first is that tunneling probabilities decrease exponentially with the increasing thickness of a barrier. They also decrease exponentially with increasing height of the barrier in energy. And finally, the tunneling probability decreases exponentially with the increasing mass of the particle doing the tunneling. So understanding or remembering those three features of tunneling will help us understand a lot of the effects that occur in modern semiconductor devices. As far as quantum mechanical reflections are concerned, particles with, another, with enough energy to get over a barrier can actually reflect off of the barrier if the potential is changing abruptly. To avoid that, we would have to engineer the structure to make sure that the potential changes slowly on the scale of the electron's wavelength. So we've discussed some general features of quantum mechanical tunneling and reflection in this lecture. In the previous lecture, we discussed some general features of quantum confinement in semiconductors. These effects can be important from time to time in some semiconductor devices. But in all semiconductor devices, quantum mechanics is important because the crystal potential that gives rise to the covalent bonding of the semiconductor crystal varies on an atomic scale and affects the properties of electrons. Th these quantum mechanical effects lead to the band structure, the momentum versus wave vector or momentum versus K that we've talked about uh, in earlier lectures. These processes are also responsible for producing the effective mass of electrons and holes in semiconductors. So in the next lecture, we will talk about how these quantum mechanical effects affect the properties of free carriers in semiconductors. Thank you.